Ben. I am one of two RCA members here, two RCA ordained members here. Uh, the other one being Mark Poppin back there. He's a, uh, the admissions director at Western Seminary in Holland. Uh, I went to Western Seminary in Holland, Michigan, and at that time met my wife, or we, be, we got married between our second and third years, and then we took a call together to a church in Indiana and served there for nine years, and somewhere during that time, I could give you the longer story, but eventually God, I felt as though God was leading me toward uh, doing a PhD. So about a year and a half ago, I entered the PhD program at Fuller in practical theology. And so that's where I'm at right now at Fuller. And uh, yeah, I was really glad to learn of what the fellowship is doing and even more glad to be a part of it because at, in theory, you are my people. In theory, you are my people. Evangelical, reformed, scholarly minded. I would like to think that you are, you are my people. I don't know entirely if that's true. Uh, I think I've been discovering that that is somewhat so. Uh, but certainly I align really well with those who are evangelical and reformed in the PCUSA and then ECO, EPC, CRC, RCA. So uh, just glad to be here. Uh, what else did I want to say? Um, I think I wanted to say that there was mention yesterday of Michael Horton's talks being a rough draft of a rough draft, and I want, just wanted to see if whether I could play that get out of jail free card too. Uh, this is a, a little bit of a rough draft of a rough draft. And then I, I did also want to pick up on what Joe said before of, in some ways I detest talking about the doctrine of the ascension. You said about theories of atonement, uh, the doctrine of ascension, because sometimes it's just a, a theoretical idea instead of a reality. And, uh, and I, saw, I, I hope in some ways I talk about it as a reality and not just a theoretical idea. Uh, I think that will be helped by the fact that I'm coming from the perspective of practical theology. So what follows is a practical theology of testimony. Practical theology of testimony. So as a theological discipline, practical theology is not a settled discipline. In most institutions, it has replaced pastoral theology and sufficiently displaced in the uh, sort of Schleiermachian schema the notion of applied theology. Yet, depending on who you ask and in what context, you'll still find a variety of answers to the question, what is practical theology? So right here at the outset, I want to offer two brief answers that will frame the rest of my reflections. So first, practical theology regards the theology of practices. So naturally... <laughs> There will be a point at which I say that. The, um, so yes, it's practical theology regards the theology of practices. So naturally, if our task here is to imagine theologically through the lens of the ascension, I will do so by examining a practice, in this case, the practice of testimony. Moreover, practical theology entails a particular methodology. The core guiding principle of most methods in practical theology is that theological reflection starts with experience. Practical theology specifically rejects any theological methodology that embraces pure cognitive speculation. Instead, practical theology is grounded by the concept of praxis, theory-informed or theory-based practice. Every practice we engage already entails an underlying theory, and any reflection on theory must start with what is already so. We are not blank slates waiting for doctrinal etching so that we can finally function. We are not dry sponges waiting to absorb a theory so that we can finally get into action. We are not information vessels seeking knowledge that we can finally apply via some practice. Theological reflection to make sense of experience uh, 
and be more faithful in our practice of the faith. So combining those two notions that I've, those two answers to the question, what is practical theology? I wanna attempt a rather simple description of practical theology. It is about enacting faithful processes that lead to ever, ever more faithful practices. It is about enacting faithful processes that lead to ever more faithful practices, namely beginning with some sort of pra- praxis, what's our current practice and what's the theory that underlays it, and then looping into the reflection part. Often PT takes advantage of the social sciences and the ways in which we can describe reality and what's the context that we're in. I'm not going to do too much of that here though, Uh, but also all the theological resources that we can bring to bear in that reflection and then loop back up to our practice, our our praxis, and and how, how is it reshaped? How has it become a new practice? So it's about this loop from praxis to new praxis, to new praxis, to new praxis. So as you can imagine, this tends to be very practical. Oh boy. So thus, yeah, I'm not seeking to say anything original, building off what Jerry said earlier, but certainly something practical. So there's my little introduction to practical theology. Now, a a little bit defining this praxis, uh, and I want to start by just defining what I mean by the practice of testimony. I think it'd be wise to clarify my use of the word. Because in the Christian vernacular, testimony is often synonymous with conversion story. So that if I asked a lot of Christians, can you please share your testimony, most would tell me how they came to faith. While that's a very legitimate form of testimony, the practice I wish to address has a wider scope than that. In um, Practicing Our Faith, which I brought along, maybe you've seen this book edited by uh, Dorothy C. Bass, Practicing Our Faith, 12 different Christian theologians take on 12 Christian practices. And... What I mean by testimony is not what Thomas Horton Jr. means by the term in this book. Judging by his essay in Practicing Our Faith, testimony happens almost strictly within the confines of Christian worship or at least within the church. It occurs during preaching, song, ritual, and the behavioral witness. And again, there's nothing wrong with any of those forms of testimony, but this is not the practice to which I'm referring. Instead, I'm addressing the regular, consistent practice of bearing witness to God's activity, past, present, and into the future. I'm referring to a God consciousness that leads to God talk. I'm referring to that giving a voice to what we have experienced through perception, things seen, heard, tasted, touched, smelt, intuited, And I would even add to it this definition of testimony that comes from um, Fuller Theological Seminary's Practices of Christian Community course. I didn't write this definition of it, but I'm uh, agreeable to it. Testimony. The practice of attending to others by sharing and listening to stories about God's activity among us in order to consider what God might be up to in the community and its participation in God's mission. Testimonies involve recalling and reflecting on God's work in our individual and shared lives in order to remind each other that God is constantly at work in front of us, around us, in us, and occasionally through us. So, testimony. I'm talking about that God talk. Today at lunch, I sat next to, now I can't remember your name, Barry. Yes, I sat next to Barry and he was sharing how God had influenced him in his current congregation. Correct me if I'm wrong? God talk. So that's one way in which I want to define the the current practice. The other way is I want to start with my experience of it. When it comes to my experience of testimony, I'm struck by the variety of conflicting manifestations I have encountered. Shortly after Christ thrust his grace upon me in college, I determined that I wanted to study some theology. At the time, I was a computer science major. I quickly befriended the campus chaplain, Lloyd Steffen, who was gracious enough to take on a few directed readings with me. 
in all our conversations, both those associated with the directed readings and those outside of it, I cannot recall ever hearing Lloyd Stephan talk as though God were alive. We talked about Niebuhr and in the process talked about Christ, but he never talked as though God actively did anything. His God had no active agency and certainly not enough agency to interact with him personally. And it's not without tragic poignancy that he received, received his MDiv from Andover Newton, which is at this time closing its doors. Shortly after this, I started hanging out with a Pentecostal crowd. I'm a kind of a magnet for Pentecostals. And it was during this time that I met Jack Hall. Jack had a peculiar habit. In, in an otherwise commonplace conversation about superficial things, Jack would preface nearly every statement with something akin to this. Do you know what the Holy Spirit just said to me? Or, the Holy Spirit just pointed something out to me. Other people might say, you know what it just occurred to me? Or, here's what I'm thinking about that. But he would say, do you know what the Holy Spirit just said to me? As though every single thought is from the Holy Spirit. Being in conversation with Jack was a little unnerving. And then another set of my experiences. For the nine years prior to ending PhD studies, I served as a pastor of a church in Lafayette, as I said. During the beginning of my time there, I became keenly aware of a certain pattern that many members of the congregation, especially members of the youth group, would tell stories that included a sudden turn of events which would then be identified as, quote, a God moment. The seemingly unexplainable was intelligible, was accounted for by asserting, then God showed up. I could not help but notice that this God seemed like a God of the gaps, an invocation of Deus Ex Machina. This short list of personal experiences captures but a fraction of the various ways in which God talk takes place within our congregation. Surely, you could call to mind many of your own experiences, most of which leave you maybe with similar questions that I have. How exactly do we experience God's presence? To what extent can we talk of God's activity? And when we do, how do we talk about God's activity in a way that is responsible? I'm quite certain that we will never be able to definitively answer all the questions about God's activity, at least this side of the kingdom come. But I will say this, reflecting on these questions in the light of the ascension will provide some solid direction. Moreover, a decidedly reformed view of the ascension helps us develop some necessary criteria for responsible practice of testimony. So, entering into some theological reflection on testimony via the ascension. The first and most obvious observation to make, now listen, Jerry, is that Acts 1-9 follows Acts 1-8. <laughs> I want to repeat that, and I want you to share that with a neighbor. Acts 1-9 immediately follows Acts 1-8. Go ahead. Pedagogically, I want to plant that for you because that's sort of the basis of why I'm even talking about this in the first place, Acts 1.8. That is, the recording of the ascension directly follows Christ's words about witness. He was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight immediately after he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Ascension and witness are forever bound together. Until the full consummation of the kingdom, we are obliged to bear witness. If we do not, the very stones will cry out. 
which, not ironically, is the way that many in this day are coming to faith. They are sooner to acknowledge and praise God because of mountain grandeur than they are because of Christian witness. Yet it is not as though Acts 1.8 and its fulfillment throughout the book of Acts is an anomaly. A consistent pattern exists throughout the scriptures. They have a narrative structure. There's many genres, but there is a narrative structure which practically pleads with us to testify via the stories of God's involvement in our very human lives. In and of itself, the Bible consists of two testaments, testimonies. Despite becoming flesh and dwelling among us, Christ did not leave written documentation for us to follow. Instead, we are left with the testimonies of those empowered by the Holy Spirit, not just the original apostles, but we see it play out in Acts 2 and throughout Acts. The Spirit is poured out on all flesh. So the call to witness via testimony is a call on all of us, a call not just to talk about God, but about our experience with God. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we embolden the witness of all. And having looked at the front side of Acts 1-9, we might next look at the back side. From that perspective, we might see that the ascension funds our witness by putting us in a state of perpetual advent, always waiting, looking, and hoping for the presence of God. It may not seem so, but the ascension is deeply related to Advent. Most prominently, we await the second Advent, but in the meantime, we are ever waiting, looking, hoping for the next move of the ungraspable and unknowable Holy Spirit, which blows where it chooses, and we hear the sound of it, but we do not know where it comes from or where it goes. This profound sense of expectation is to be juxtaposed with the apostles standing dumbstruck in Acts 1. We are not frozen in place like them. Rather, the word from the men in the two white robes should cause us to possess a rich hope that God is active and moving in our world as the Spirit is poured out. We ought to be attentive to God's ongoing work and then, in our testimony, invite others to look with us. We ought to echo often the words of Jacob in Genesis 28. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Because perhaps it is not that God showed up, but that we showed up. We might even say that if we properly retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we could generate a theology of astonishment or a theology of wonder. Those of us in the Reformed tradition, so well known for being the frozen chosen, so rational in our approach to the faith, might do well to cultivate this sort of theology. Among other things, I think this might fund a more missional ecclesiology. To me, this is the most compelling part of the missional church movement. Indeed, despite the way in which some missional church literature strays, this theology of wonder, this expectation as the spirit of the Spirit is the defining characteristic of any properly missional church. As Dwight Shiley describes it, the missional sh church is a community led by the Spirit. It is a community that constantly looks for the, for the signs of the Spirit's leading in its own life and in the surrounding neighborhoods. Its communal imagination must be pregnant with anticipation of the Spirit. Oh, to be pregnant with the anticipation of the Spirit. It makes me think of uh, Garrett speaking this morning about his friend, W-I-J-D, what is Jesus doing? And Jesus is doing a lot, but I also want to have a bracelet that says W-I-H-S-D. What is the Holy Spirit doing? What is the Holy Spirit doing? doing. Because Christ went up, the Holy Spirit came down, and the church is sent out with the Holy Spirit, but also in and among where the Holy Spirit is already active. Acts 10, right? Peter. Cornelius is already, the Holy Spirit's already working in Cornelius before Peter shows up. This is the call of the church to be pregnant with anticipation of the Spirit as we discern that coffee for lawyers is actually supposed to be food for the homeless. And likewise, the call of ordinary disciples in our ordinary lives. Um, Amanda Drury 
has written an excellent book on the practice of testimony, Saying is Believing. Uh, the Necessity of Testimony in Adolescent Spiritual Development. So it's, in theory, a book for adolescents. Trust me, it's not. It's a book for adults as well. But she's written this great book, and she provides a great suggestion for cultivating this awareness. She, rec- she recommends asking a simple question after people have recited the narrative of their day to then reflect back and say, where might God have been present in the normal ordinary parts of your day. Asking this question regularly may help create a hopeful expectation that God can and does move in everyday life. This is important because people cannot talk about something they do not notice. While on the theme of the Spirit's activity, I want to call upon our reformed forefather in the faith, John Calvin. In his explanation of the creedal affirmation that Christ ascended into heaven, one of the first things Calvin notes is the apparent contradiction of Ephesians 4.10. Christ ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. We've heard that a couple times here. At first blush, we might assume ascension implies a distancing of Jesus. He has gone away. Paradoxically, Paul points out, and Calvin affirms, it is exactly because of his ascension that he fills all things, for it is good that he has gone away, recovering the theme. As Calvin states, and we so readily observe, for Christ left us in such a way that his presence might be more useful to us, a presence that had been confined in a humble abode of flesh so long as he sojourned on earth, carried up into heaven, he withdrew his bodily presence from our sight, not to cease to be present with believers still on their earthly pilgrimage, but to rule heaven and earth with a more immediate power. Unquote. It is a movement of dissension, incarnation, ascension, dissension. In this, we are reminded that God is withheld from us unless God initiates. As Bart asserts, God's revelation is not at our power and command, but happens as a movement from God. We experience it as grace and solely through grace. We experience, our experiences of God are free gifts of God's canonic, agopic love. This is not only central to the ascension, but also a central affirmation of our Reformed faith, sola gratia. We have nothing of God without God's gracious initiative, which informs our God talk in two ways. First, it is entirely normal to expect to hear from God, to relate to God, and to experience God's love. This seems nearly impossible for those of us who live in what Charles Taylor calls the eminent frame. The buffered self permits no such penetration. Yet, God's nature cannot be otherwise. Perichoretic self-giving is God's very way of being. Second, we always testify when we do testify to God's initiatives. Some people say graces, I prefer the word initiatives, because God's gifts are not always experienced as such. Sometimes God grants us the gift of conviction. Sometimes God grants us the gift of the opportunity of loving our enemies. Sometimes God grants us the gift of being called into a land that we know not of. So if you've been following so far, you've heard me connect the ascension to three aspects of testimony. First, the ascension obliges our witness. Second, that the ascension funds our witness as we look expectantly for the unexpected spirit of God. And third, that the ascension reminds us that God's coming is always initiated as a gift by God. From there, we might mention the next obvious thing about the ascension, Christ assuming his place at the right hand of God. We affirm that it is at this time that Christ truly inaugurates the kingdom and establishes his supremacy over all things, which is cause to consider one hallmark of Reformed spirituality, the central place of God's sovereignty. Does anything establish the sovereignty more than Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension? All the more reason to affirm another sola, 
Soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone, and that testimony, like any other Christian practice, must be to the glory of God alone. And on this point, I want to suggest that this may be a particular strength of testimony by Christians of the Reformed persuasion. For us, there will be an inherent tendency to exalt God instead of self. It was precisely this danger of self-congratulatory speech that made theologians like Bart so wary of personal testimony. Yet I would contend this is precisely why those steeped in the Reformed tradition should practice it more often. We are probably least likely to make it primarily about us, especially if we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, exalting Christ to the throne and acknowledging his lordship in all things. As Drury states, it is precisely this high view of Christ that may in fact open Christians up to receive input from others and prompt them and their community back to the scriptures in order to provide further clarification and direction. The exaltation of Christ prompts us back to the community, check to see, did God actually say this? And then to the scriptures, does it actually align with the word? These checks and balances, the body of Christ and the word, address one of the primary dangers of testimony, namely that we might attribute to God that which, which ought not be attributed. Let me say that again. Primary dangers of testimony, namely that we might attribute to God that which ought not be attributed to God. Moreover, this reformed piety, which tends towards self-negation and God-glorification, will lead to an appropriately tentative form of speech. It is certainty of speech that irks us about some forms of God talk. But for those of us who radically embrace the sheer grace of God, we are, for better or worse in our theological anthropology, experts in the realm of inadequacy. Consequently, we dare not speak so unequivocally. The more we embrace the lordship of Christ, the more likely we are to recognize our human fallibility and speak with some measure of caution and hesitancy. Again, Drury offers wise advice in this regard. Recognizing that there is a large margin for error in both reporting and interpreting what one thinks is an encounter with God, we would be wise to counsel our people to use tempered phrases such as, I could be wrong, but... And I think God is leading me to. Karl Barth captures this dilemma well when he writes of our need to echo God's self-revelation. He says, we ought to speak of God. We are human, however, and so cannot speak of God. We ought, therefore, to recognize both our obligation and inability, and by that very recognition, give God the glory. This is the tension in the ascension. We all at once recognize the lordship of Christ, our own obligation to bear witness, our own inadequacy to do so, and the robbing of God's glory if we do not. Bart captures our predicament to the, uh, he compares our predicament to the one faced by the prophet in Isaiah chapter 6. It's worth quoting it at length, so bear with me here. Bart says this, It is thus clear to Isaiah from the very first that what he has seen and heard demands to be expressed and proclaimed. It must go out as a human word on human lips to be sounded forth and heard in its immeasurable positive and negative significance among all people throughout the earth. But he knows of no human mouth which is able and worthy to form and express that which corresponds to the matter. He must confess that he is a member of the community of the community and people in which there are only unclean lips, which contradict rather than correspond to the matter. He thus knows that what he has seen and heard must be expressed and yet cannot be expressed by a human mouth. It is in view of this dilemma that he cries, woe is me, for I am undone. Indeed, woe is us. For we are obligated to speak of God and yet dare not speak of God. Lord, have mercy. And indeed, the Lord has mercy. As Calvin states it, Christ sits on high, and Melissa quoted this earlier, Christ sits on high, transfusing us with power. 
And from his mighty position, Christ despoils his enemies, enriches his people, and daily lavishes spiritual riches upon us. We have power, power to speak, because Christ graciously grants it to us. Furthermore, we are not called to bear witness and then left to do so under our own power alone. Rather, we have an advocate. The Spirit testifies to our innermost being, and we testify about the Spirit by the Spirit. Again, to quote Drury, she captures this well. The truth of the matter is, before a word of testimony is on our lips, the Holy Spirit has been testifying to our own spirit, speaking into and forming our identity, preparing us in such a way that we might have the spiritual eyes to catch a glimpse of where and how God might be at work in our collective lives and empowering us to testify to that effect. Anything true and good concerning God that comes from my lips has its origin in the Holy Spirit testifying to my spirit. Both Christ and the Holy Spirit empower us and empower our testimony as we speak of God's graciousness and seek to bring God glory. And so it is that I've attempted to add three more bits of wisdom based on the examination of the ascension. And there's lots of ways to make a connection between ascension and testimony, but allow me to summarize the six that I just made. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we inherently recover the call to bear witness. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we may live in a state of perpetual advent. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we can paradoxically be confident of God's initiating presence. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we ensure that any talk of God's work brings glory to God. If we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we remind ourselves to speak in tentative language about God's call on our lives. And finally, if we retrieve the doctrine of the ascension, we acknowledge and live into our source of power for all this work. So last week, I was up in Idlewild. If you're from Southern California, you might know where that is. Uh, oh, I don't know where I'm going. That way. <laughs> up in the mountains. Uh, about 5,000 feet of elevation, so we're near sea level, obviously, right now. And I was up there with a group of Seventh-day Adventist pastors. It's wonderful to hang out with Seventh-day Adventist pastors. Uh, Melissa made some allusions. She might, would love to talk about Sabbath. Talking about Sabbath with Adventist pastors is fantastic. Um, they just take Sabbath very seriously. But I was up there, and I was supposed to lead parts of this retreat except for one particular piece. And that was a six-hour solitude that they refer to as an EPC, Extended Personal Communion. It's not unbiblical to think of the idea of going up on a mountain and being with God, right? That's essentially what takes place. And as this was set up, uh, the man who set it up said something that just sort of stuck with me. He said, when you initially go into this EPC, the first thing that I hope that you focus on is just one simple idea. Enjoy God and be enjoyed by God. And so I walked out um, and went into this, what could be described as kind of a, a canyon, a valley between you know, mountains rising up on both sides of me. And just embrace this prayerful state of, God, I want to enjoy you. And to the extent that it is a reality, be enjoyed. Uh, Enjoy you and be be enjoyed by you. And as I entered into this time, it was interesting because I felt like the wind picked up behind me. And I felt like God's presence was in the wind, ministering to me. And saying to me almost exactly 
what Brian articulated yesterday when Brian Burton got up and talked about baptizing these young people and that the greatest privilege he has is to be able to tell them about their identity, about who they are and whose they are. And as I was sitting in this mountain valley, I felt God's presence come over me through that wind and had this distinct sense of realizing just how clearly I am a beloved child of God. And what is often preposterous to me, that God enjoyed me. Who I am and whose I am. And the most amazing part of that, about this experience to me was that the moment where it finally sunk in beyond just like my superficiality or just some thought to my, my, my nefesh, my whole being, right at that very moment, God immediately impressed upon me all sorts of people in my life. And this impression of seeing them as beloved children of God. Not, it wasn't as though God said, now I want you to see them the way I see them. It was like God just let me see them the way that God sees them. And so instantly in my mind were the faces and names of all these pastors who are a part of this retreat, 24 of them. And it was almost like every, every one of them had a middle name, Beloved. And then instantly in... in my being, were all the names of the students of the class that I'm currently a TA for, whose papers I was grading in that upcoming, that they, all of them, their name was Beloved. And then, I won't be here tomorrow because I'm getting on a plane to fly to Vancouver and leading a retreat up there, and all the people, I know already of the people who are involved in that, and all of them came before me with this name, Beloved. And I just have this sense that I, I met God in that time, was overwhelmed by God's presence, and felt utterly compelled to see others as beloved. And as God impressed that upon me, and I was sent to enjoy God and be enjoyed by God, it was immediately like, I was thrust out too. It was like the fulfillment of 1 John four nineteen. We love because you first loved us. And it wasn't even a, a conscious choice. But I do want to say that without that intervention of God, and hopefully on a regular basis, I would not see myself or any of you with such eyes. Now, it's up to you to decide whether me sharing that honored the six principles I just drew out of the ascension but I want to hope that it did. And depending on where the Q&A goes, I have uh, something I might do with you, but I want to close with this. A little quote from Calvin, right at the beginning of the Institutes. What good is it to profess with Epicurus some sort of God who has cast aside the care of the world only to amuse himself in idleness? No, we profess a God who is supremely active and loving. That's my, my own piece there. The question is his, my own pieces. But sometimes I get that impression. Christ has disappeared, right? And we don't treat him as Lord because of it, but a lot of our people treat him as Lord elect. There will be a time when. But he has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne. He is Lord, not Lord elect. He has not cast aside the care of the world only to amuse himself in idleness. So to continue quoting Calvin, no drop will be found either of wisdom or, and light or of righteousness or power or rectitude or of genuine truth which does not flow from him and of which he is not the cause. Thus we may learn to await and seek all these things from him and thankfully to ascribe them once received to him. To me, that's a good summary of what this testimony is about. So I'll close there.
Amen. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, and I hope that in some ways what I was conveying, both in the talk and, and in my experience, was a completion of what Garrett was saying today. Of it, it, that, that question that rings out for us is, am I accepted? What was the third question you had to, oh, not, not am I in control, but what was the, oh, am, yeah, will it be all right? There's some sense in which that's answered. You're deeply loved by the God of the universe. Everything's going to be all right. Changes the way we show up to every place. And... Uh, I'm really compelled by that. I don't know how many of you, I, I think he's a PCUSA guy, Kurt Thompson. Is that true? Anybody know of Kurt Thompson? Uh, he's a psychiatrist. He wrote a book called The Anatomy of the Soul, wrote another book called The Soul of Shame. Uh, but he recommends in The Soul of Shame, just as a discipline, that we just uh, regularly um, go into prayer, being willing to accept this voice from God that says, I am so pleased that you are here on earth, Brian. I'm so pleased. Um, so yeah, so I, I try to work that in some of the practices we do too, but uh, this particular time, I just never heard that phrase, enjoy God and be enjoyed by God. Um, which growing up for me, uh, Garrett was talking about wounds this morning. Uh, what was it? G.I. Joe guys, wound, related wounds. Uh, I grew up in a, a home that was full of conditional love. If I get good grades and I'm the best athlete on the team, I will be deeply loved. If I don't do straight A's and uh, best athlete on the team, I will not be loved. And uh, it's still a continuous struggle for me to step into the presence of God and believe it. God actually, really? You love me? Yes. <laughs> uh, I could. I said, if we retrieve the doctrine of the attention, uh, attention, whew, of ascension, we inherently recover the call to bear witness. We may live in a state of perpetual advent. That is awaiting an expectation. Thirdly, we can paradoxically be confident of God's initiating presence, which is what we've talked a lot about here. God goes away, and yet God is more present. Christ goes away, God is more present. Fourthly, we ensure that any talk of God's work brings glory to God. Fifth, we remind ourselves to speak in tentative language about God's call, because after all, Christ is exalted, we are not. And then finally, we acknowledge and live into our source of power for all this work. Somehow, not only that power that was at work within him that raised Christ from the dead, the whole Ephesians 1 thing, somehow that power is kind of available to us through Christ's ascension and pouring out of the Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, that's why I was saying that language from Drew that like, I could be wrong, but I think that maybe God's saying, this is what I've heard God say. Do you, could you echo that back? So I even went to this man who talked about enjoying God and, and being enjoyed by God. And I went to him and I said, here was my experience of that. I really felt like I experienced God's presence and was immediately like God just said, you, uh, God impressed upon me this ability to see others as beloved. And he said, you know, a lot of people have that experience. That feeling deeply loved, they end up deeply loving others. Um, but that was a way of me speaking tentatively about it, but him then re being able to affirm yeah. Yeah, I, I really uh, went hard on the inadequacy, self-negation uh, theme that can sometimes come out really strong in, uh, in some Reformed theologians. Uh, I mean, especially Bart, because Bart was just uh, reacting to his era. But... Um, but I don't, I don't want to say that completely about us. In our theological anthropology, I hope we can be humble enough to say uh, we are not God, but almost Pope John Paul II's uh, theological anthropology, we're angels, right? Psalm 8, we're just a little lower than Elohim. You know, we're just a little lower. And, uh, and so we should be humble enough to say we're not God, but we should also have some view of who we are and who God empowers us to be, even though I struck a pretty negative tone in here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, and God's deciding to do a new work. Isn't that Isaiah 43? Yeah. Totally. Mm hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I can say too much more than what you just said. Uh, Where did it come from? Uh, my head, I think. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just, uh, just this sense of the Holy Spirit's pervasive quality, not just... Uh, and, and I really did mean what I said about the missional church. Right, so th there's a lot of differing views of what happened with this missional church movement. But the easiest way for me to sum it up is s some of the things that happened with missionaries who went out, right? So Leslie Newbigin kind of started the missional church movement when he came back to the West and said, what does it look like to have a missionary encounter with the West? All based on what was our missionary encounter with everywhere else. And based on that missionary encounter, him and a whole lot of others discovered Oh my gosh, God was up to something before we got here. Um, 
And I got to push back a little bit against Darren's slide earlier because it said uh, Christ went up, the Holy Spirit came down, and the church is sent out. And that is perfectly legit, ex except sometimes people think that's the missional church. Um, but, it's, but it's not just that the church was sent out. It's that the church is sent out with the Holy Spirit's empowerment, but also God's up to a bunch of stuff. God is up to something. God is working before. God was on work um, in my life before Kevin Higgins showed up and Gene Hong and John Radice and all these key people who played a role in me coming to faith. But God was up to something. The hound of heaven was chasing me down regardless of the, the Holy Spirit showing up also through those people. And uh, I think that's part of what it, what it is, is that just, just this, this sense of like the Holy Spirit really being poured out and being pervasive and funding. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you're good? Oh, I thought you were going to say something more. Yeah, and I think that's the pattern we see in Acts, right? So it's not like Paul has to go to Macedonia and bring God with him. It says that Lydia was already a God-fearer. Uh, same thing with Cornelius. He was a God-fearer. Like something was already happening. They had some sense of it. Even if it's Paul in Acts 17, like you know not who this God is, but let me tell you who this God is that you worship. Like something's already happening. Yeah, she had a question. I have been very influenced by the book called mm. Mark Yeah. Mm -hmm. that you, you have to go through yourself and find out what does he have for me to do? Yeah. What can I do? How can I do it? It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Sure. Sure, yeah, I read it. It's good. <laughs> yeah. You're welcome. Jerry, can we end on that positive note? Yes.